Hello, everyone. So, um, okay, let's start. Um, this is uh, the evolution of the language. I'm going to talk about how Elixir evolved. Uh, this, uh, I can see the screen. Um, it's fine. Um, so, I'm going to talk about uh, how Elixir evolved. Um, I've been uh, using Elixir for about four years now. Um, so, about um, around time when 1.0 came out, and we um, and I joined the Elixir team like a couple of, couple of years couple of years after that. And uh, so I've been, think, I've been seeing how the language evolved since 1.1. I think that's what we're mostly going to talk about today, like how um, it evolved after hitting 1.1, so how the language grew uh, as a stable language. Um, this is my handle on the internet. Uh, it has been said. Uh, it has been said I'm uh, in the Elixir core team. I joined in the 2016. So I did like one year and a half of Elixir before being in the core team. And then I joined the core team and I've been there um, since so I started in uh, with Elixir in uh, like late 2014, so it's uh, about five years now. Uh, this is something I do at every conference. It's a conference selfie. So if we can do a conference selfie, this is really hard because yes, that's the spirit. But I'm gonna have to. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very long room, so <clears throat> so we have to do it like this. But the hands up were a really great idea. Yes, hello, perfect. Uh, <laughs> this is a. Like a unique conference selfie because my mom is here. I brought her over from uh, Italy. So it's just been, uh, yes, a uh, long journey. Yes. <laughs> yes. So the pilot flew the plane, the plane not my mom. So uh, it wasn't that hard, but uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so I work at a company called WinMaps, and uh, usually uh, this is the best part of the talk. Is the mic still working? Yes. It's the best part of my talk because people don't know what WinMaps is, right? So it's a lot of fun. Uh, how many of you know what WinMaps is? Yes, because we're in California. Uh, <laughs> so WinMaps is a website where you can go and uh, find dispensaries for uh, marijuana, and you can uh, go and find doctors that uh, prescribe magical marijuana, and uh, you can uh, order it online now. Uh, there are bil billboards in San Francisco, so uh, I, I assume people know what it is over here. Uh, but usually that like, gets a lot of laughs. Um, anyways, um, we're hiring, of course, so that's, uh, that's where you want to go if you're we're hiring Elixir developers, so that's where you want to go. Um, let's start with a timeline of Elixir, of its life, and let's start before Elixir's life. Let's start when Erlang was, um, uh, when people started working on Erlang, uh, that was 1988, uh, so that's kind of when uh, Erlang was born. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be open sourced for a while. Uh, but that's when uh, when work on Erlang started. Uh, and of course, Erlang is the base of Elixir, so kind of the Elixir history starts at least with Erlang. Um, it, just for context, in 1993, Ruby uh, was, um, so work on Ruby started, uh, and this is just to, um, I like it because it, uh, it puts this into context, like it was not that long ago. Ruby doesn't feel like a very old language, and Erlang does for some reason, but uh, they, were, they were pretty similar um, in time. In 2001, programming Ruby uh, comes out, so Ruby becomes kind of a more mainstream language. In 2004, Rails comes out. This is important because uh, it launches Ruby in the web development world, world and it, um, oh, it's also important for us particularly because uh, Jose, the guy that uh, created Elixir, uh, was in the Rails core team, so Rails is a web framework, and he was in this core team, and really what um, made Elixir happen was uh, partly things that were happening in uh, this web framework and things that Jose had to work on um, in, on Rails. Um, in 2007, Clojure came out. This is just for context. Clojure is a language that uh, um, has a lot of similarities to Elixir. Just to, for context, it came out in, uh, 20, in 2007. And then in uh, 2010, the, the book Seven Languages in Seven Weeks um, came out. And at this point, um, Jose, the guy that invented Elixir, was um, kind of uh, trying to um, fix a bunch of stuff with, with Rails related to concurrency, and the story was that at some point he stumbled upon this book, and one of the seven languages in this book was Erlang. So just I came to know about Erlang, and he seemed very, uh, like it seemed, it seemed like the language uh, that would be the most fit for doing what uh, um, Jose wanted to fix in Rails. And the famous quote from Jose goes that he loved everything that he saw in Erlang, but he hated everything that he didn't see, and that's uh, when Elixir happened. So in 2011, the first commit to Elixir happened, um, and 
it's the start of the journey of the Elixir language. Uh, so starting from there, then a bunch of significant events for Elixir in uh, half of uh, 2013, the first commit to Ecto was made. Ecto was a big, first big library for Elixir for doing database, um, integrating with the database. Um, in January 2014, the first commit to Phoenix was made. Phoenix is now the uh, main web framework for Elixir. And in July 2014, the first Elixir conf happened. Um, so the first conference is dedicated entirely to Elixir. In September 2014, Elixir 1.0 came out. So that's when the language became stable. That's around the time where I joined. Um, and I started working with Elixir. And this is, uh, yeah, language reaches 1.0. And it's a big milestone because now it's, it's a stable language. Um, in October 2014, just a little while after, Programming Elixir comes out, which is the first book just about Elixir. Um, and this, uh, at this point, this is really when we're going to start talking about what, what the, like the, how the language has evolved from now, from this point on, right? Because at this point, the language is really the first point where the language is a real programming language, like an actual, actual programming language used by people. We have a conference uh, dedicated to language. We have a book um, just dedicated to language. The language has reached one point, so this is a good point to start. Um, so let's start with the evolution of the language, and let's start with what are the three things that I think shape the la shape the language the most and that um, a successful language needs in order to survive. Um, there are a team that supports the language, a community that supports the language, and an ecosystem that supports the language. And a good language in order to survive has to have all three of them. Um, a team is needed because uh, a team coordinates the efforts that go, um, that go on around the language, uh, the development of the language, um, they coordinate the direction of the language it's taking, and they coordinate the community on working on things um, related to the language. Um, the team is responsible for doing QA on the language as well, so everything that goes into the language is kind of QA'd by the team, right? So um, we review, we end up reviewing everything that goes into the language, we end up uh, ensuring that it's up to standard with what we already have in Elixir, uh, we make sure that it's, um, uh, that it belongs in Elixir, right? Um, third thing for the team is maintaining the language. So we are the one that committed to maintaining the language uh, basically forever or until the language is alive or we're alive. Um, so it's kind of a marriage thing. Uh, but the idea is that, yes, we're, we're committed to maintaining the language. So we're committed to being there um, and making sure that the language doesn't get abandoned. Um, the community is, real, is uh, arguably more important than the language. The language can have a team it can have a community and a small team, but it can't have a team and no community, right? Otherwise, it's not really um, a language. So the community is responsible for a bunch of things. The first one is experimentation. So that they're the ones that kind of drive the language, like explore the language and explore what can be done with the language and drive the evolution of a language forward. Um, they're responsible for the ecosystem as well. So a language without an ecosystem is not really a usable language because there's no, like you probably don't want to reinvent the wheel for everything that you want to do. So an ecosystem is important around the language. So you have like libraries and learning resources and um, uh, books and uh, conferences and everything that goes around the language and makes sure, makes sure that the language um, evolves and stays alive and, and thrives. And of course the community is responsible for using Elixir because if you have a language and nobody uses it, uh, what's the point? Um, so, okay, um, in, the, in this like f last five years, did Elixir grow? Um, it's really hard to tell from data because uh, it's really hard to measure the growth of a language. Um, personally, it feels like it has grown uh, a lot because there's more people using it, there's more events, but a few stats we can look at. The first one is contributors. So the number of contributors has been growing. Um, this, is the, this is new contributors each year to the language. So the number is growing and this kind of tells you that um, the number of users of the language is growing. Um, this one is really interesting, conferences. Um, so we can see like how in 2014 we said that we only had one um, conferences, right? Like one uh, conference dedicated to Elixir, Elixir Conf. Uh, we can see in 2015 the number grows, 2016 even more, 2017. 2018, there's a lot more conferences going on right now, right? So this is a measure that the community is growing, right? There's more, um, there's more need for conferences about Elixir. People uh, want to go into more conferences about Elixir. Uh, and if this conference is happening, it means that the community is there and that the community is, um, is kind of thriving uh, and growing. 
uh, X users, it's an interesting, interesting graph as well. This is the number of X, new X users. X is the package managed for Erlang and Elixir. Uh, the number of X users has been growing. The number of X packages has been growing. So people have, have been writing more and more packages. The number of X downloads um, has been growing as well. So probably means that the language is being used more and more, right? Um, this is again, this is a package manager for Erlang as well, but I would say that Ernest used in Elixir a little bit more, but anyways, like a growth is still a growth, right? Even if it's half. Um, so it's, it seems like the language is, uh, is growing. Um, and that's, uh, I mean, as, aside from the personal feeling that it's been growing, this is the data that we have and it shows that it's growing. So this is, this is good. Um, what are a bunch of things that we got better at since 1.0? So things that, are, that we are better at now than we were when Elixir 1.0 came out. Um, the first one is porting stuff. So I remember uh, in the earlier days of Elixir, people would port everything to Elixir, right? They would uh, find libraries written in Ruby, for example, Ruby. I, I will mention Ruby most because most of the people that worked with Elixir, especially at the beginning, came from Ruby. So uh, a lot of what was happening was people taking Ruby libraries and just porting them over to Elixir, right? Um, this, most of the time, it turns out this is not the best way to go because Elixir is a different language than Ruby. There's different principles that have different uh, features and design constraints. Um, so porting s things straight from another language usually didn't work. Uh, and it feels like we got a lot better at that. We're now writing better libraries that have architectures that are for Elixir. Um, so it's, uh, it feels like we improved at that. Another thing that we improved at is figuring out that uh, Elixir is not mostly Ruby. So this is, uh, I remember when people uh, talked about Elixir in the earlier days, this is how they would picture it, right? Mostly Ruby, like just sugar uh, on top of Ruby um, with support from a bunch of features from Erlang, right? Um, so it felt like a, like a slightly different Ruby with support for like functional programming and processes built in. Uh, turns out, and there was usually we would shy away from OTP a lot. Like we would, uh, we would try to um, hide the details of processes and hide the details of um, OTP stuff and applications. And we would try to put that away and try to write code that it was more similar to what we were used to, which was again mostly Ruby, I would say. So there was not a lot of uh, leveraging OTP um, in the earlier days. Uh, right now we we became a lot better at that. We figured out that Elixir is mostly Erlang. Um, in fact, it's probably like 90% Erlang. And then there's a tiny little bit, tiny little part, which is, which comes from Ruby, which is the syntax, right? Uh, mostly the syntax. Um, and then we figured out that, this, I mean, there's other influences as well. There's influences from Lisp and Clojure um, and other languages as well, but mostly it's Erlang. Um, we learned about um, how to embrace OTP as well. So right now there's definitely a push for, um, you can see it in uh, like learning resources and uh, uh, conference talks and blog posts that uh, we are embracing OTP and then we're learning how to get better OTP and leveraging OTP um, in Elixir instead of shying away from it. So we're using more features from OTP, we're using, uh, we're discussing it more and we're just getting, getting better at it. Um, as I mentioned before, we improved the design of libraries as well. Uh, so right now um, there's a lot more libraries coming out that are very, very well made. Um, and I, I will talk about how, why I think this is happening uh, later a little bit, but the idea is that we're, we're writing better libraries, we're writing faster libraries, uh, we're focusing on uh, better design principle, we're focusing on writing libraries that have better architectures, um, that have better abstractions, that are more uh, composable, so we're certainly a push um, towards libraries that are more thought out. Uh, and this is improving the ecosystem greatly, and this is a great thing, because it means that the whole system and the whole language and ecosystem um, get better. One thing that I really, <laughs> that really um, touches me is the pipe operator. So in the early days of Elixir, the pipe operator was a big, big feature. Um, so when you, when you would sell, try to sell Elixir, would you pitch Elixir to someone? The pipe operator, like I've heard it come before processes and OTP and supervision trees many, many times, right? As like one of the first features, like as a pipe operator. Um, turns out a pipe operator is not, is not that great. Uh, and people, like you can see the obsession of people with the pipe operator uh, all the subs there are all proposals for changes to the pipe, to, for like making the pipe operator more useful, right? Like pipe to the right, pipe in the middle, pipe as the third argument. Uh, there's, there's a pipe and a sign. There's all, all kinds of proposals. Um, 
this is this is my reaction when I see that. Like I don't want to I don't want to deal with that. Uh, but we got a lot better, a lot better at uh, at dealing with the uh, pipe operator. We realized that this is just like you can use it. It's fun. It's nice. It looks nice. Uh, it makes some things better looking, but the functionality is really like tiny tiny thing. It's just a macro, and it's not really something that we. Uh, it's not really a language feature, right? The language feature behind it is macros, which is which are really great. But this is just a very small thing. Uh, so we became kind of shruggy about um, the pipe. This was not true, I repeat, not true at the beginning because people would uh, write libraries and design things so they would pipe well together, which is uh, a bit crazy to me. But, but we're, we've become a lot better at this. Uh, so now we are, we're kind of accepted the role of the pipe as a very, very tiny, useful, um, good looking thing, but very tiny. Okay, so there's a bunch of stuff that we got better at. Um, I want to really briefly talk about the most significant events uh, in the history of the language. Um, so the things that shaped the language, I think, um, and made it made it what, what it is today. The first one is Ecto. So Ecto, um, I mean, everyone, probably everyone that has used Elixir knows about Ecto, right? It's a library for in, interfacing with databases and integrating uh, with databases. Um, the nice thing about Ecto, so it came out as the, one of the first big libraries for Elixir. Um, and it was nice because, it, so it came out before Elixir 1.0 um, and work on it started well before Elixir 1.0. But the nice thing about Ecto is that I think kind of represents the first um, Elixir library that is designed for Elixir, right? Um, so it shows, a, it, first of all, it showed a new way to do things because uh, a lot of things, as I mentioned before, a lot of things before came from other languages because people were used to writing other languages so they tried to port stuff um, to Elixir from other languages. Uh, Ecto kind of shows that this is this is not maybe the best way to go, but the best way to go is to design libra libraries for Elixir. So Ecto kind of shows that with, um, for example, with uh, having a focus on data and pure code. So we had something like the change sets, right? Ecto change sets to, to track changes to, um, to database records. They're just data, uh, data and functions. So this is, and they're mostly pure code, so you can do tests on them um, and all this kind of stuff. And the um, schemas are the same, they're just data and code around it, they're, they're immutable. And uh, it kind of showed that like, you, a good design for a library for a functional programming language is to have a very big core of data and pure code and then a bunch of um, mutable and imperative stuff on top, right? For example, we have the repo, which is where all the, um, the imperative and mutable and side effects uh, side effect operations are confined, right? So it, it showed a way to um, to design libraries in Elixir that was that was more Elixir focused. Um, it also validated meta programming in Elixir. So uh, we kind of we kind of used Ecto at the time to uh, make sure before this is remember this is before Elixir was 1.0, and we kind of used Ecto to validate that the meta programming and the macros in Elixir would work. So we wanted to to know that we could be able to write a library like Ecto without having to change anything in the language. Like uh, we could be able to write the DSL that Ecto has, the, um, the um, uh, syntax for Ecto without having to change anything in the language. So this is, uh, this is what happened. We, we made this DSL and it worked and it kind of validated the, the, the design choices in Elixir for writing macros where could design choices. Um, and it showed as well the power of meta metaprogramming. So we will, um, Turned out to regret this because like when Ecto came out, uh, it really showed the power of metaprogramming and people really got excited about metaprogramming, right? And metaprogramming, it turns out, it's um, really dangerous and it's really hard to use uh, most of the time because it's, uh, it's hard to debug and it makes things harder and in DSLs are harder to understand. So it turns out that, yeah, we will regret this. Uh, now we've become better at this as well. We're using metaprogramming way less. We learned that the best way to do things is usually to have Macros as a very thin layer on top of, of uh, code in the, or of normal functioning and data structure interfaces. So you write a big uh, data functions uh, core and then you maybe put a slight level of macros on top. Uh, but at the time, this, uh, people would write macros for everything. That's, uh, that's luckily changed. Um, so this is what Ecto contributed to Elixir. It's, it's a lot of st important stuff and I think it has a really, really important role in the growth of Elixir. Another library that has a really important role is, of course, Phoenix. So Phoenix is the main web framework for Elixir. Um, and since a lot of people came to Elixir from languages like Ruby, 
uh, that are really focused on web development. It was really important for the success of the language to have a good, good support for web development and uh, in, in this case a good framework for writing web applications, right? And this is what Phoenix turned out to be. Um, so it turned out to be a, a web framework that was designed specifically for Elixir, right? So it had similarities, similarities with, uh, for example, Rails from Ruby, but it was designed for Elixir. So it, it leveraged uh, Elixir libraries like Plug uh, and built on top of that. And it also um, embraced the design of Elixir having um, like great support for things like uh, pattern matching. It had, it leveraged pattern matching a lot. Uh, it leveraged um, immutable data structure, structures a lot. So it, uh, it was a fit in Elixir, right? Um, and the really good things that while it hooked people through the web, so it brought people over to the web, uh, to, to Elixir, sorry, uh, through the web framework, right? Um, the nice thing is that it added something as well. So uh, especially on top of things like Rails, which was, again, what most people were coming from. So adding channels uh, was a very specific, Elixir specific thing. Uh, so channels are an abstraction over real time communication uh, and mainly web sockets, right? Um, and there was not a lot of good support for web sockets um, in other places. So it was really good that Phoenix brought support for um, this, such a good support for things like uh, web sockets and real time communication because people now got interested in Elixir because of this, right? People knew about, came to know about channels and they got interested in Elixir and they tried Elixir and then they became Elixir users. Um, so I think channels are, and then other languages uh, like adopted this kind of designs as well uh, and support for real time, but this really made Elixir kind of known as a, as a language with good, real, good support for real time web applications, which is really good. Um, and more recently, we got a lot of users uh, hooked into Elixir through NERVS. So if you don't know what it is, NERVS is a framework for building like um, applications on embedded devices and so like Internet of Things stuff. Um, and so we, we really didn't, like, didn't expect that, that Elixir was not just for the web, right? This is like the general feeling was that Elixir was mostly a web language. And it's really good that NERVS came out because NERVS kind of showed that Elixir can do other stuff as well. Um, and uh, I, mean, I mean, I guess most Erlang people knew that Erlang was good in embedded devices because that's where it was born. Uh, but it was good to show Elixir people as well that, uh, that Elixir can run on embedded devices that can do other, other stuff uh, other than, um, than web development. And so a bunch of people came over to Elixir because of how NERVS uh, lets you build um, applications for embedded devices in a pretty, pretty um, uh, comfortable and useful way. Um, so this, this has been really good. Um, what are, so Phoenix, Ecto, and um, NERVS are, are three, I think, really, really important uh, things that happen to Elixir and they shaped how Elixir is. Um, what are the growth factors that I think are, have been most important for Elixir? So the key factors, factors that made Elixir grow and become what it is today. Um, the first one, I think, is documentation. Uh, it's not maybe the most important one, but it's definitely a really, really important factor. So every one I've heard feedback from about documentation loves the documentation for Elixir, right? And the good thing that we have about Elixir is that the language is very well documented, but it also provides very, very well built tooling around documenting your own things, right? So for example, this is how you write documentation in, for an Elixir function. You write it right in the code with markdown, it's easy to write. Um, and then when you, w once you write this, you can convert it to a consumable documentation, for example, um, in HTML format, so you have the documentation um, in the browser, and this is this is just this is the language itself, but it's the same for libraries as well. And you can, by writing documentation in the code, you can also consume it in the terminal, for example. So there's good, really good support for writing documentation and then consuming documentation. Um, and I think that that has made the language uh, really easy to consume because I mean, if it's well documented, people are more willing to use it, uh, and it's easier to use it, right? The second thing that I think really, really uh, pushed Elixir was the really good support for tooling and user interface and developer happiness, especially over Erlang, especially initially. Um, so we, so Elixir focused a lot on the having good tools and having good user interface. For example, Mix was a really um, selling feature at the beginning, right? Especially compared to Erlang, which didn't have Rebar 3 yet. Um, so Mix, the build tool was really, really um, appreciated and having a good, um, user interface 
was really appreciated. Um, and this is just a bunch of features that came out um, with Elixir in the last, I think, couple of years that are really just, if you think about it, are just focused on making the developer life better, right? So XREF, for example, is something to, um, to do cross-reference. I mean, Erlang has it, right? But we added support for Elixir and to do a bunch of stuff to, um, for example, track colors of things, see, uh, see dependencies between modules, uh, or the formatter is a really good one. So we added a code formatter that uh, automatically formats your code. Uh, and if you think about it, that's re that really has no usefulness when you when you put it in the in the programmer perspective and in sorry in the program perspective right whether a elixir program is formatted or not doesn't change how it works but it makes the developer life easier because it um, standardizes how code is written and it makes makes it easy to format your code and everyone writes code in the same format so it's a it's a quality of life improvement um, and I think it's been really important XUnit diff same thing like we have diff in the code uh, that's just for this is an example of uh, of how diff in the code looks like. Uh, so this is again useless uh, in the way of how things work, but for the programmer is a pretty good quality of life improvement, right? To see the diff of uh, when a f test fails, see why it fails with a diff, it's just, it's just nice. And we focus, focus a lot on that, and I think it's, it's paid off because Elixir is, a, um, as far as I know, and it's, at least for me, is a pretty um, joyful language to use. It's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to use. Um, of course, a, a key growth factor has been the community of Elixir. Um, so I think the Elixir community has been, it's definitely been the, the best community I've ever been in. Um, it's very loving, it's very caring, it's very wholesome. Uh, everyone is welcoming, to, especially to newcomers. Uh, there's a lot of events, there's a lot of bonding in the community, there's a lot of events that are dedicated to Elixir, a ton of meetups uh, dedicated to Elixir, and having such a good community. I've heard people that stay in the language because of how the community is, is welcoming, right? And how the community is uh, a good place to be. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's been a really good, a really important factor in the growth of the language, having a good community where people want to stay in, right? Um, so what's next for the language long term? So right uh, like an hour ago, James told us what's literally next in the language in the, last, uh, in the next couple of releases, but what's next long term, right? What, what will happen to the language? Um, so first thing, what will we will focus on as a team um, I think what we will focus on the most is maintenance of the language, research, and developer happiness. Uh, so maintenance just means that we will keep maintaining the language. If there are bugs, we will keep fixing bugs. Just do the regular maintenance on the language. Um, research, this is, uh, this is really interesting. We will, do, uh, we will keep doing research on things that could change the language uh, even more, right? For example, so uh, recently, uh, Jose announced that we were we tried to work on a type system. It didn't really work in the end, but that's the kind of things that we want to do, right? Keep researching stuff that could change the potentially change the language a lot. Um, so we w we want to keep exploring possibilities of how to uh, to change the language and uh, and add new things. And uh, for example, the HTTP client that uh, James mentioned before, this is kind of considered as a research project, like a big thing that we were trying to do uh, in Elixir, and then it ends up in something like the, the uh, client that we released. But this is the idea, try to keep researching new stuff um, to build. And then developer happiness. Um, I think we will, personally, I will uh, keep focusing on developer happiness a lot because it seems to be a thing that really, uh, that's really important to people. So a couple of months ago, I put out this um, poll on Twitter saying what's uh, um, next, what's the thing that you think that the Elixir team should focus on the most um, in, the, in the, its development? Uh, what, what should we focus on the most? And you can see like developer happiness was by far the first thing, right? And this is fighting with things like performance or stability. So like, of course people care about all of those, but they would rather, that they would rather have us, like, it seems like they would rather have, a f have us focus on making the language a joy to use and, and um, easy to use and nice to use rather than focusing on like changing it or innovating it or making it more performant. Uh, and of course we will focus on all of those things, but this is, I think this is really interesting and mind blowing to me that people are so interested in developer happiness. And it kind of uh, uh, mirrors what I've, been, uh, what I've been seeing of people coming to Elixir and like staying in Elixir because it's, it's fun to use, right? Um, how will the community and the ecosystem change? Uh, hopefully Elixir gets 
picked up by a bunch of big companies. So I know there are a lot of companies using Elixir right now. Some of them are bigger than others. Um, my hope is that a really, really big company picks up Elixir, right? If Facebook picks up Elixir for something, uh, or Google, or whatever com big company picks it up, it means that it, it kind of validates the language to other big companies as well, right? And it kind of uh, uh, makes Elixir a, um, a language that is recognized, uh, so that can can get used then by other big companies. And big companies using this language means more people that want to learn these languages. Um, so it kind of, I think, it would be a trampoline to get the language to even uh, bigger uh, audiences and to even uh, a, a bigger community. Um, hopefully, the ecosystem will get larger and better. <coughs> and close the gap with other languages. So right now, and right now it's getting better, but especially at the beginning, um, one critique that Elixir always had was that uh, it didn't have as many libraries as, for example, Ruby or Node.js, um, which have libraries for everything, right? And at the beginning, Elixir uh, didn't really have li libraries for everything, so you had to often write things that in other languages you were just pulling a library for. Um, this is getting better. I mean, more and more libraries are coming out. Hopefully, the, the gap will continue to close in the future. Um, and I think one thing that I'm really excited about happening is that, um, in, like, especially at the, in the earlier days of Elixir, a lot of people wanted to contribute to the language, right? This is me as well. Like, I was more interested in, con in contributing to the language than in contributing to the ecosystem, right? Uh, luckily, luckily, the language is really, really stable now, and this, uh, as uh, James mentioned, there's really basically no low-hanging fruits, fruits left for the language, right? So if you want to contribute to the language, you either have to fix some really, really obscure hard bug, uh, or you have to write a, like a huge proposal to change the language in some way. Uh, so there's not a lot of low-hanging fruits to, to just contribute to the language. But this hopefully means that people will dedicate themselves and their open source efforts to the, the ecosystem instead of the language. So I hope that we will get more libraries that are very well maintained, that have teams behind them, uh, because there are a bunch of libraries in the Elixir ecosystem that are um, they're really practically they're, they're fundamental to the ecosystem. Right? You can think about Acton, and Phoenix, uh, Nerves, those have teams, but are libraries like JSON libraries, right, which are fundamental to the ecosystem and maybe are, maybe are maintained by one guy that sometimes, like for one year, it doesn't do anything, right? And that's really bad for a language because you, we effectively, effectively depend uh, on those libraries for the language to work and for the ecosystem to thri thrive, right? So hopefully having more, less people contribute to the language means that more people will focus their effort on building very, very good libraries that are very well maintained. Um, so hopefully that's what, what's gonna happen. Uh, and I think it's happening already because we see better libraries that have more effort behind, behind them and they have more um, they're better maintained. We see that already. So I, I hope it, this trend keeps going. Um, and I think we can see that the people are co the, like the contributions to Elixir are kind of kind of going down. And this makes sense because there's less stuff to do. There's less low hanging fruits. Uh, so the the contributions are th this is the commits, and it seems like they're going down a little bit. Uh, the contributors you can see that they went up and then now they're 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 very down, right? Uh, so there, there. It seems like there's less contributors, new contributors coming in the language. And again, I think this is a good thing because Elixir is more stable, and we need people to do other things as well. Um, this is what James talked about as well. We really need people to contribute to Erlang in order to contribute to the whole BIM ecosystem. So we hope that people will contribute to Elixir less because there's less stuff to do, and contribute more to the whole BIM ecosystem. So the libraries. Uh, that can be used from Erlang, Elixir, and other Beam languages or uh, contribute to OTP directly into the compiler so that we all benefit from it. Um, so, like, especially recently because there's been a lot of work. Uh, so El Elixir and Erlang were very happy that they are, oops, they should have worked. There you go. Uh, this is us and Erlang that are dancing together. Um, <laughs> But we're very happy that 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 we that we get more and more contributions to Erlang. This is uh, the contribution contributions from the Elixir team to Erlang directly. So we're trying to, and when I say we, they are trying because they've never contributed to Erlang, but they are trying to uh, contribute more to Erlang so that we all benefit from it. Uh, and then one example was the documentation um, proposal, right? That is standard for all the Beam languages. Uh, we're seeing. 
a lot of support from er for Erlang in the Elixir library recently as well. So this is an example from Benchy, which is a benchmarking library, which provides an Erlang interface directly so that people that use Erlang can use it natively uh, instead of having to use the, the weird Elixir.Benchy syntax. Um, you can see this happening in the, for example, telemetry was a, was a matrix library that was released recently and it was released as an Elixir library. Uh, and then at some point it was rewritten to be an Erlang library so that everyone can use that, right? I think this is the direction that things are going and I'm really glad that it's happening it's because so, so that we can use this kind of stuff from everywhere, right? Not just from Elixir or not just from Erlang. Uh, and again, the EEP48 for documentation was, was another thing that was kind of directed at benefiting all of the Beam languages instead of just Elixir. Um, this is a question that I ask myself once in a while, is Elixir successful? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, definitely Erlang is on the rise because of uh, how things are coming back to a place where Erlang is really a good fit for many things, um, like real-time communication and um, fault tolerance and concurrency, and Elixir is definitely riding this wave, but, but it's also adding stuff on top of Erlang, so a lot of people are using Elixir for as the features that Elixir provides as well as the features that Erlang provides. So I think, uh, hopefully, yes, it's successful. It's a hard question to answer, so that's, uh, that's the best thing I can do. Uh, will Elixir survive? I don't really know. Um, um, I'm not sure, but uh, the good thing is that there's no mu not much relying on the team um, and the language right now to build stuff on the, with the language, right? So the language provides enough tools that you can build a lot of stuff yourself, right? And while this is the graph of commits to Elixir, so it's still mostly just a, uh, but the good thing is that we are providing tools so that the community can build things themselves instead of relying on the language. And uh, the HTTP client, again, is an example that's of something that we wanted to build uh, into the language, but then we figured that there was really no need to build it into the language because everything was that, uh, like we could use Elixir to do everything that we wanted to do without changing the language, right? Um, and this is something interesting. So this is the only feature with, you know, the, if you know what it is, it's a, it's a construct um, similar to, to case to basically do uh, to pipeline uh, partner matches. Uh, and this is the only thing that we added to Elixir that could only be added to Elixir um, instead of being able to be added on top of Elixir, right? So this is uh, the only thing where we had to change the language um, in like six or seven versions. It's the only thing that where we had to change the language in order to add it because it couldn't be added by users as a library. Everything else that we added could probably have been added by users uh, on top of Elixir, which validates the fact that we provided enough the language provides enough tools and abstractions to pretty much build what you want on, on top of it, which is really uh, what we want. Uh, so how to contribute uh, in the future? As James said, um, most importantly, contribute to uh, things that can be, uh, that the whole Beam community can benef benefit from, so like the Erlang compiler. And um, I think that if you don't have time to contribute, a really important thing to do is to start discussions around things. So if you think that there's something um, that could be improved in Elixir, often the best thing you can do is write a proposal on how to improve it, even without writing any code. Uh, but writing proposals and starting discussions, uh, I think it's the most important thing because then other people can do the work of actually writing stuff, right? But I think the hard thing is to come up with ideas. So if you come up with an idea or if you want to improve something but you don't have time to actually do it, often like starting a discussion or sending in a proposal is a, is a perfectly fine way to contribute and it's probably the most important part of um, making that change instead of writing it. Uh, ultimately, we as the language authors are just basically giving the language to the community. Uh, that's the language and we're throwing in, yes. <laughs> Uh, so we're just, uh, we're just like the language is in the hands of the community. The language itself is pretty stable. Uh, it's working fine. Um, so there's really not a lot to do on the language. So most of the work is now in the hands of the community on, doing, on improving the ecosystem and making sure that the uh, whole um, landscape of Elixir and our lungs stays, uh, stays thriving and keeps growing and keeps getting better. And that's all I have. Have any, anyone have any questions? Yes. By the way, when this is on, his uh, lapel mic doesn't work. So ask your question, then turn it off. I think it, I think it works because it's a different color oh. mic. Yes. So I had two questions. Yes. Uh, one is uh, 
So I think it's super cool that Elixir is that the Elixir community community is moving to embrace the kind of like Erlang way with OTP and stuff. Um, and it definitely makes sense for people who've been programming Elixir for a while. Um, it seems to me like if you are, if you take the original types of folks who are coming into Elixir, which were like people who are just web programmers and Ruby folks, like where's, how do you do the work to make OTP more accessible to those folks? Because right now, I mean, Elixir's OTP is basically Erlang's OTP. It's not, there's not a lot of abstractions. And then there's also like, I know a lot of folks encounter problems when they try to bring, like, you know, and they try to do OTP in the sort of production web world with like Dockerized deployment and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So sorry, that's one question. Yes. <laughs> and the other question I have is, if people are gonna contribute to the Beam, then they essentially have to be Erlang programmers. Yes. Is there any point at which, and I feel like that, like how do you, how does a new contributor, like who maybe only knows Elixir and maybe just learned Elixir, contribute to the Beam? Yes. Uh, is there any hope of ever being able to contribute to the Beam directly in something other than Erlang? Right. Um, so let me answer the second one first. Um, there is, uh, so yes, you have to write, probably have to write Erlang if you want to contribute to the Beam. There's a chance you have to write C as well, right? Depends on like what's your, what's your background and how good are you at different things, right? Exactly. So the, the Beam is a, it's bigger than Elixir because Elixir all comes very high level, right? But the Beam is like it comes from the virtual machine and goes up to modules that do stuff on data, right? Um, so uh, yes, you have to probably write, uh, if you want to contribute to OTP directly, it's really, really hard. Uh, it's definitely harder than contributing to libraries or stuff because it's a language that's like 30 years old, right? So a lot of stuff has been done already and uh, there's, there's 30 years of history in the language, right? Uh, one good thing is that I think that uh, moving forward, I would like, what I would like to see happening is that people don't differentiate Erlang and Elixir that much. Uh, especially, so what, uh, the way I see it is that Erlang is, uh, um, sorry, Elixir is a superset of uh, Erlang, right? Because there's more stuff you can do in Elixir, uh, like uh, protocols, for example, that is not in Erlang, but there's nothing that I know of that is in Erlang that you can't, can't do in Elixir, right? Um, so it's really a matter of, uh, like, I didn't ever learn Erlang. I just learned Elixir, and then at some point I figured out what was, what was the, equivalent syntax in Erlang to do the stuff that I, that I knew how to do in Elixir. Um, and I think that that's where we should focus on. So when you do, um, there's a good, good, really good example. Uh, wait, this. Well, this is a good, very good library that what it does is provides an, an Elixir interface and then also provides an Erlang interface, right? And what it says, it says, if you're using this from Elixir, do this. If you're using it from Erlang, do this, right? Uh, telemetry is the same. Like, it, like, you could show only one of these and people that know both would figure out how to do it, right? But by showing both, I, th I think that the direction we're taking is that we're embracing that we're all either Erlang or Elixir programmer. We don't, we don't have to be one of them. Uh, and people can just, like, see this and figure out that, okay, like, even people that just, just know Elixir will keep seeing this Erlang syntax come up. At some point, we just realize, I think, that uh, they are the same. It's just different syntaxes, right? So that's as far as learning Erlang. Uh, goes for me, then contributing to OTP itself is a different thing, right? Contributing to the OTP world can mean just writing libraries that work. Like, think about, does this library need to be in Elixir, written in Elixir? Does it take advantage of things that are only in Elixir, like protocols, for example? If it doesn't, write it in Erlang, right? And that's what happened with telemetry, right? It was written in Elixir. It didn't really make sense to have it only in Elixir, so it was rewritten in Erlang, and now everyone can use it, right? That's, uh, I think that's the direction we want to take. Um, the first question was, um, we're oh, was we're out of time, so I'll, I'll talk to you, yes. <laughs> All right, well, we're out of time, sorry.